if you recall, last week we were talking about a kind of a, I guess I'll say a weighty subject, um, the subject of um, Jesus being a priest in the order of Melchizedek. But as we pick up today, um, the writer of Hebrews is still talking about that. But if I don't remind you of that, you're going to think, what in the world? Um, we're going to start in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. And I've entitled this Spiritual Immaturity. And I was trying to think of how to put a positive spin on it, but there's really not one. <laughs> you know? And spiritual immaturity is something that I can be right in the middle of and the more immature I am the less I will see that and the less I will be open to anyone mentioning that maybe I'm immature it's just never never a good thing if you are taking your kid to the doctor and your doctor says your baby weighs less or is shorter than or is not meeting the milestones everybody else is meeting at that age you think oh couldn't you tell me something positive? If you are um, are going to your kid's um, teacher conference and the teacher says you have a sweet little son and, and he's loving and kind and gets along with others, but he's immature, um, it sort of takes away all the good stuff that the teacher said. And the same thing with an adult, if you would go, you know, to a counselor, a pastor or someone and be told that your responses or the way that you're, you're taking the things that happen to you in life are immature, we kind of immediately shut down. Now, because this is the word of God, not me or a teacher or a doctor speaking, I'm going to ask you just to sort of hang in there today and listen to the words that are here. And no one here is going to hang a badge or a sign on you and say you're immature. <laughs> That's not the point. And, and, and you shouldn't do that to me speaking either. It's not our ability to really see into the hearts of people, but the Holy Spirit does and can. And the Holy Spirit can help us with that if we will sort of see it and own it and say, you're right. Now, it's easier, I think, to let the Holy Spirit tell me something difficult about myself if I start out thinking, okay, God, I'm open to whatever it is you're going to say. If I've already got an attitude and think, I don't want to hear one more bad thing, I'm fine. Um, it's very hard to hear. So I'm just going to ask you this morning to be open. You don't know the writer of Hebrews. I don't know the writer of Hebrews. It's a, a mystery. Nobody knows who wrote this book. But we do know that when it was put through the filter of people praying about and looking at what should be put into the Bible, into Scripture, that it more than passed the test. Nobody argued about whether Hebrews should be in the Bible. So picking up in chapter 5, verse 11, about this, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain. That's talking about Melchizedek. And actually, in case you're thinking, I wanted to hear more about that, the writer does pick it up later in the book. But the writer feels like he can't or she can't really go into this anymore right now because right now people are in a state that they would not be able to pick that up or understand. The writer says it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Now, dull of hearing is not hard of hearing, like I need a hearing aid or I need you to look at me when you speak. Dull of hearing means that you're not listening. And we've all been around someone who um, we try to talk to and they're just not listening. And so that's not the person you choose when you really want to bare your heart or, or, or get something off your chest or tell them something important because it's, it's hurtful, isn't it? If somebody is, is just dull of hearing, there's yeah, yeah, whatever, you're always talking about that. Well, the writer is saying that the people he's writing to have become dull of hearing. They are just not interested in hearing anything about how they can serve Christ better. Verse 12, 
for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. So they, he thinks that, that really most of these people have had plenty of Bible knowledge. They've had plenty of instruction. They've had plenty of chance to get to know the, the teaching about Christ. They should be Christians who are actually teaching others, but instead they just need someone to keep helping them along and shoring them up and reminding them of who God is. He says, as an example, you need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. Now, Jesus said good things about children. He said that to come to God initially, that we have to come as a child, that we can't come at with as a know-it-all adult who's telling God what we want to have happen. We have to come in that innocence of a child. But the way this writer is speaking about a child is saying, you're, you're childish Christians. You've stayed as little kids. You can't take anything. I'm trying to teach you something more important that will help you go on to bigger and better things, but you still hang back into the baby stuff, just like you are just barely Christians. Verse 14 says, but solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Now think about what that means. Every day we have experiences, good things, bad things, and we put them through our mind and we discern or understand or figure out, is that good or is that bad? Is that good for me? Is it good maybe for someone else, but not for me? And the exercise of doing that, of forcing ourselves to really think about good, evil, maybe somewhere in the middle, but People who do that regularly and do it with the, asking the Holy Spirit to help them, they mature. And it gets to the point, it's not a big, long thought conversation or a prayer time with God. They just instantly, the Holy Spirit says, no, nope, not good. And they just go on. They don't even argue about it. But maybe that's something you really wanted to do or wanted to have in your life. And you think, what do you mean not good? I can do whatever I want, right? And yes, you can do whatever you want. Um, but that practice of you kind of forcing your mind through the thing. We used to, um, we talk about it kind of disparagingly now that we used to have on the back of our membership cards, a list of things that we could not do and be a member of an Assembly of God church. And other churches did that too, not just us. And people make fun of that and say, well, it's your own conscience and, and the Holy Spirit can guide you, right? And yes, the Holy Spirit can. I think the people who made those lists were mature people who'd figured out what was not a good thing for them to do. They'd seen it, tried and failed and, and saw through experience and were trying to fast track everyone and say, don't do these things and you'll be okay. The trouble is we wound up with these super believers who didn't do a whole list of things but were mean in their heart. They were mean to new believers. They said harsh things. They were judgmental and nobody wanted to come to their church. <laughs> you know, who are you to tell me that, that my pink hat is out of line or whatever it was. And so we threw away the list, but sometimes we really didn't get the change in our hearts not to be mean anymore. We still had the standard within us that behind our bulletin we were thinking, ugh. And there's something about maturing in God that as we do that, it's not about us being more of a know-it-all and thinking, I've got this all figured out. I know every popular song and the page number. And I can tell you what verse 5 is. Those things are not things that make you more mature as a believer. They show that you've been aging in the church, but, but your spirit may not really have gotten any more mature. 
So verse um, one of chapter six says, so, or therefore it says, but so let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. Now that doesn't mean that there's something not good enough about teaching about Christ. The maturity is also going to teach us more about Christ, about God. But the elementary part is the key there. Let's not always get stuck in this sort of go in, say, sorry, God, I've been messing up again. Let's start over. And we just keep starting over and starting over and starting over. And we never really get on to the point that we realize you don't have to keep backsliding. There's nothing in the Bible about you needing to backslide. It'll do you good. It doesn't say that. And so there's something about maturity that you get beyond a certain point and you're not going to ever go back. You get the sense in your heart of realizing I'm his and he's mine and I'm not leaving that. No matter what you tell me, no matter what gets messed up in my church, no matter what gets messed up in my life, no matter what doesn't seem like I thought it was, I know who my redeemer is and I'm sticking with my redeemer. But they had this list here of things they were focusing on. I'll just tell you, most of them are not things that people I run into every day are focusing on lately. Let's look at them together. Not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works. Well, I did just kind of talk about that, didn't we? We, we do have people who are doing things that they think are really important, but really they're not helping anyone. <laughs> you know, I make them feel good that I'm able to do that. But dead works are things that you work really hard at, but you really kind of feel a little resentful of, like I did this and nobody will do this for me or nobody else is doing this. Or we say things that are showing us to be some kind of person that we think is valuable, but we don't have the Holy Spirit working through us. And so it's a dead work. It's not one enlivened by the Holy Spirit. It goes on to say repentance from dead works, like doing that over and over and over. If it's dead works and you figured that out, let it go. Stop doing that, you know. Um, say, sorry, God, I realized that was not it. And in some cases, it leaves our churches a little wimpy, you know, like stuff that you were doing in your own strength that wasn't something God asked you to do. And you say, OK, God, I see. I'm letting that go. I really resented that all along. I felt like nobody noticed that I was the only one picking up trash after the service, or I was the only one that was out mowing the grass, or, and nobody ever said a word, and it was a thankless job, and sometimes other people took credit for it, and God says, let that go. So you let that go. Sometimes it does leave our churches a little um, wobbly as far as how, who's going to do that now? So what? There's nothing as important as you and your relationship with your Savior. It would be okay. If, today, I think the grass is too long. Yeah, but it's okay. It's better to have long grass than to have bitter saints, people who are doing things but resent it. They, don't, they are not doing it in the power of the Holy Spirit. They're feeling like they're being taken advantage of. And, and I'll just say people have been taken advantage of in church. They have been. They have not been thanked. I'm not pretending that that didn't happen. But when that does happen and God gives you a release and says that's dead works, let it go. Don't just keep coming back to that and going over it again. Adjust yourself and telling the tale everywhere you go just to make sure everybody understands you used to do that and you don't anymore because God released you. Well, the people were kind of caught in that cycle of just laying the foundation of repenting of dead works. They talk about instruction about washings, and those were really more the ceremonial washings that were Jewish. They weren't per se Christian things. There's nothing wrong with washing your hands and, and, and even making sure you're clean before you go to church or before you eat um, your food. But, but Jesus coming had fulfilled the law and getting all hung up about those ceremonial washings was not helping people mature in their faith. 
they were very much into laying on of hands and we still lay hands on people but when i lay my hands on you it's a point of contact i'm saying i'm believing with you for God to heal you. I'm not healing you when I lay my hands on you. Now there actually is sometimes when I'm really upset or, or needing support and someone does put their hand on me, there is this human sense of camaraderie of, I care about what you care about. And that is a healing good thing. I think it sometimes causes people who aren't touched enough to think that people who lay hands on them and pray for them have some super power going through their hands, but that's not really it. Um, that kind of human touch is why we touch babies a lot or why we, we touch the people that we love. There's an important thing there, but laying out of hands um, is something that, that they were focusing on too much. And the trouble with it is, it allows the person who's laying on the hands to become almost a substitute for God in your mind. And that should never be the case. It's not true. So you can see their list. I'm not gonna go through the whole list. It talks about eternal judgment. It's not that we don't believe in these things, but the writer is saying, you're focusing on these things. And I, I want to kind of push you, lift you, mature you towards something that's more important. Verse 4 says, For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Now this is probably the most controversial passage of scripture in the Bible. Um, I've talked to you about some other ones that are controversial and, and for that reason many people don't preach on this. We know that there are, are, are verses that would say the opposite and we know that Paul says there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God and that's true. We know that the scripture is positive, but he's saying here, when you remain in your immaturity, when you don't go on to the greater things of God, when you get stuck in this cycle of little bit of faith, sin, repent, little bit of faith, sin, repent, little bit of faith, feel pretty good, sin again, repent. When you get stuck in that baby stop, and never go on to really understanding more about who God is and how solid your relationship is with him, that he is the solid rock. He's not like the sinking sand that we sang about today. Until you can get so that you can articulate, can argue with the devil if necessary, certainly able to hold your own with your neighbor or somebody else who's um, coming against your faith until you get solid and more mature, you are vulnerable to give up all those things that you've tasted of, that you've experienced a little bit, when you're just sort of sitting on the edge, teetering there and never going on to maturity, there's a possibility that you can lose your faith and it ends up making you a bitter, contemptuous person that will not respond to God anymore. So you're, you're almost, you've put yourself in a really bad spot if you've toyed with being a Christian and now you back up and say, I guess not. He compares that to a farming picture here in verse 7. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. If we have a, real, a, a field just full of thorns and thistles, we're not going to go and start yanking them out and <laughs> throw them away. 
they generally burn that field and just say, you know what, bad news here, let's start over. And, and it's a metaphor, really, when you're thinking about a person who at one point was drinking in the rain and the blessings of God and was growing something beautiful in their life, once they're choked with thorns and thistles, it's another way of saying what he just said. It's really, it, it, it's, there's, it, almost no hope for that. But in verse 9, he softens it and says, though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you've shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end. And that's really my prayer for you, for us as a church. You know, sometimes I get uh, kind of hung up. I go to some meeting, some, so how many are you running now? And I'll say, no, we've been averaging about 12, or maybe I can say 14 that month, or whatever the number is. I don't lie about the number. People look at me like, oh, really? <laughs> and, and I get hung up on that, and then I'll come back to the altar and be praying, and I'll have God remind me that it's his time, that it's his work, that he does it his way, and isn't that what we want? And yes, it is. That's the only thing that we want. We want people who are growing in their faith. We want you to mature to the point that when you are in the community, you're the one laying hands on someone and praying when they say they're sick. We want you to be little um, outreach points from Faith Assembly of God, and not just from faith, but from God himself. Um, each one of us is really has it within us to be a teacher. And when I say teacher, it's not always necessarily stand up in front of a group and spout off something or lead a Bible study. It's a teacher in that the good things of the Lord are so known in you that you so know that's not how God is or that is how God is that with confidence you're able to help people who are struggling, who are ready to kind of fall off the edge, who are teetering and, and thinking, I don't know, I've been hurt in church, I've had bad stuff happen, people lied about me, they didn't trust me, I just don't know if I want to get back into that God thing again. And you, in your faith, are able to say, those are things that you have experienced, but that's not my experience of my Savior. Let me help you to see who I know Christ to be. That's a maturing thing. And in verse 12, so that you may not be sluggish. Nobody really wants to be sluggish, do they? You see a slug outside? They're just going along slow, leaving that slime trail behind them. I can see it out on the sidewalk where a slug is gone, and nobody wants to be a slug. It's probably a little worse than having someone say you're immature. But now the writer is saying, so you won't be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And really, that's what this is all about, isn't it? Jesus was a promise to the world. The Messiah was a promise that God made. The promise to Abraham that through him, everyone in the world would be blessed. We want to inherit the promises that say that one day there will be no more sin, there will be no more killing and bad diseases and all the things that we fight right now. One day, the world will once again be as God created it. Those are the promises. And to be an inheritor of the promise, you have to hold on, be strong, Strong, be strong in the Lord, not strong in your own tough self-discipline. In fact, the Bible says that when I am weak, then he is strong. When I am weak and I recognize God, I am too weak. This is too hard to do. It's not my nature. But I recognize in faith that you can do it through me, then I'm strong. And that doesn't necessarily only apply to your salvation. When you think about 
yes, I can stay saved, or I know if I mess up, I can say I'm sorry. Those are absolutely true, but we need to move beyond that. And that's what the writer is saying. He wants to teach them some things that will help them move beyond just that foundational getting your foot in the door with Jesus. He wants to move them on so that they are strong, so that their faith is unshakable, so that they're able to actually have something worth saying to someone else. It's interesting to me that a new believer, someone who's had their heart just really touched with that hot coal of the Holy Spirit and, and they're convicted and they're sorry for their sins and they want to serve God. Those are the people who talk about their faith. But really, what do they know about faith? They made it through one altar call, you know, or, or one sermon or two or three. The people who know something about faith are the people who have actually been saved for a while and had their brother or sister in the Lord betray them, have had a cancer. There's a good um, article in the Live this week about someone surviving cancer and what that taught them about the goodness of God and about their faith. Those are the people who are you, who've been Christians long enough to be hurt by that, who've been Christians long enough to realize the church is not perfect, who've been Christians long enough to say it's not fair and it's not but I trust Jesus as my savior anyway, and I'm going through. <laughs> I'm gonna keep holding on, and, and I'm not holding on by the skin of my teeth. It gets solid and sure. We have an anchor, and I'm getting into my next week's stuff, so I'll stop with that, but there's a really cool passage in there about Jesus being an anchor that's sure and secure. And you don't need to worry about things like the verse there that, well, you know, if you know and you experience all these things of the Lord and then you just step away and say no I'm not believing that anymore you don't have to worry about that because that that sense of relationship is so strong and that's what I pray for us here that we will be known as people who have strong faith unshakable no matter what happens